For the past 40 or so years, video games have been around as a source for entertainment, to grow friendships, or as a way to release stress. While the days of arcade halls are pretty much long gone, video games are still here to stay and the industry is bigger than ever. In these past years they've grown out to be the most profitable source of media in the world and more people than ever are playing them. And that's with good reason. Though loved by many, the video game industry has had its rough moments here and there. When games like Mortal Kombat and Grand Theft Auto released back in the day, lots of people felt uncomfortable with the amount of graphic violence these games portrayed. The question of, does all this aggression influence people in a negative way, started to surface. Since then, more and more negative subjects within society have been linked to video games, like racism, misogyny and gambling addiction, just to name a few. But I won't discuss these subjects in this video. Because, yeah, just like any other huge multi-million dollar industry, video games have definitely sometimes been rightfully accused of these allegations. But here's the thing. A lot of these accusations also have been disproven in the past. The whole discussion of violence in video games should be a thing of the past, but because subjects like that often get put center stage in the news media, they regularly overshadow all the positive things video games have to offer. Throughout the years, video games have become so much more than just entertainment, and is seen by many as a valuable source of education. That's why in the upcoming weeks I'm going to make these videos to see if 40 years of video games can help you to understand society's problems and discussions. Starting off with a subject that has been around for such a long time, yet people still seem to disagree about it. Global warming, or climate change in recent years, since even the name is subject of disagreement. Even though the effects of human interference on the climate have been known about since the 1880s, and a general rise in temperature was linked to carbon dioxide as early as the 1820s, it would take a long time before anything about global warming became public knowledge. In fact, it wasn't until 1983 when scientists found a huge hole in the ozone layer above Antarctica that media started to report on the subject. And now ozone in the news. Followed up by the hottest summer ever measured at that point in 1988, global warming became inevitable. But how did that translate to video games? Well, it didn't really. In the early 80s, arcade halls were still very popular and video games were still just meant as entertainment. Nobody would go to an arcade hall to learn about global warming, but rather to beat other people's high scores. It wasn't until later in the decade, mainly because of the release of the hugely popular Nintendo Entertainment System in the US in 1986, that people were able to play video games at home and developers were able to create games that had a bigger focus on storytelling. This also brought the beginning of puzzle and strategy games, and that's where the first signs of the educational purpose of video games started to surface. 1989's SimCity was a far stretch from the city builder as we know it today. Instead of building your own city entirely, the player gets dropped into an existing city with the goal of tackling one of eight scenarios. One of these being Rio de Janeiro 2047, in which the player has to save Rio from an incoming flood caused by global warming. Though very limited in its technology and educational purpose, this was the first time climate change was ever pointed out in a video game. It is highly likely that SimCity creator Will Wright used his knowledge from this title as a baseline for his next project. 1990s Sim Earth, where SimCity focused on just one scenario in one city, Sim Earth tasks the player with a whole planet on which they have to create life, then create societies, and then make sure these societies don't kill each other. Climate change actually becomes its own gameplay element in this game. Where later strategy games would focus more on war and defeating your enemies, Sim Earth's main goal was to create world peace with as less pollution as possible. Sim Earth was in a lot of ways ahead of its time by including things like climate change. But the solutions to these kinds of problems stay very much on the surface. When societies start to generate too much emissions, the player can simply flip a switch in order to convince every world leader to start looking for a cleaner energy source. If only it was that easy in the real world. In the same year, another sort of game started to rise in popularity, but not because of home consoles or its strategy elements. Thuis in het milieu, or at home and the environment, was a Dutch educational game and one of the many games used by elementary schools in the early 90s 
to teach young children about certain subjects. In the game, players get very basic questions about the environment and what he or she can do to counter pollution or littering. Things like bringing your own bag to the grocery store, recycling and walking to school instead of letting your parents drive you there are just some of the simple things presented in this game to fight environmental issues. Still very much on the surface as far as solutions go and hugely outdated by today's standards, these sorts of games were at the forefront of what would become serious gaming. Though the bigger public was still hesitant to talk about climate change in the 1990s, it did gradually become a bit more talked about. It was not only the media that started to take notice, but politicians and world leaders started to discuss the situation as well. This resulted in the very first climate treaty in 1992, the establishment of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1995, and the signing of the Kyoto Protocol by 192 countries worldwide in 1997, focusing on scaling back global emissions drastically. Strategy games kept up the trend of including real-world problems as game mechanics. The second SimCity now let the player make its own city and introduce things like ground and air pollution and choosing an energy source. But it was actually two years earlier when world management simulator games were taken into the next generation with Sid Meier's Civilization. Instead of focusing on just a city, Civilization let you create a, surprise surprise, civilization in a complete region. Pollution now actually had permanent consequences. Grassland could change into swampland and farmland could change into deserts. These land tiles then couldn't ever be used by the player again. The Civilization games kept this theme of challenge in the second installment in 1996. These land tiles that were permanently damaged by pollution were now indicated with a skull just to hammer home the necessity of the environment even more. On the other hand, games started to appear in which climate change wasn't directly raised or used as a gameplay element. In fact, It might come as a surprise that 1991 brought us environmental awareness in the form of Sonic the Hedgehog. Where most children who played the game back then probably didn't realize that the whole game was a criticism on human interference in nature, Sonic's creator Yuji Naka stated in a 1997 interview, Dr. Robotnik is a slightly radical representation of all humanity and the impact humanity is having on nature. In 1991 it was a very sensitive subject to talk about the environment and while I had my viewpoint, I did not speak of it. With Sonic I was given an opportunity to express my views in a different way and did so, showing Robotnik using pollution and creating machinery which desecrates the environment and it is down to Sonic to change his ways. Because the problem started to be taken more seriously worldwide, mainstream media started to reflect these problems more as well. The serious negative consequences climate change could have on the world were being represented in movies like Waterworld. The dark dystopian future became the most popular setting in many different sorts of media, including video games. That's why it's not a surprise that games like Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri and the first Fallout game depicted the future of the world in a grim fashion. In Alpha Centauri's case the world was polluted so badly that the game starts by you leaving Earth in search to find a new planet to colonize. In Fallout's case it's not necessarily about climate change. Change. But it does depict a future in which world leaders spark the end of the world by dropping their complete nuclear arsenal on each other. What caused the world leaders to do this? Well, yet another way to visualize environmental issues in the world. Resource wars. Both in the Fallout world and in another game that came out in this decade, Command and Conquer, world leaders came head to head in a battle for the last remaining sources of fossil fuels, a subject that sparked a whole lot of wars in the real world, but also set the stage for future conflicts in video games. However, the next decade would actually halt the depiction of climate change and environmentalism quite a bit. Even though climate change was at this point inevitable and became a household term because of documentaries like Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth in 2004, another threat rose in this decade that would drastically change popular trends in the media. Terrorism. The attacks on the World Trade Center on September the 11th, 2001 were a huge turning point in history and sparked a huge change in world view. Movies and video games started to shift from dystopian futures, as depicted in games like Deus Ex and Final Fantasy VII, to video games like Grand Theft Auto, with their more realistic setting and depiction of inland violence. 
The first person shooter genre became more popular than ever with franchises like Battlefield and Call of Duty, which in the same decade would also shift from Second World War to more counter-terrorism focused stories. In the meantime, video games became bigger than ever with home consoles like the PlayStation and later the Xbox, and video games were now really seen as part of mainstream media. What did that mean for the previous video games depicting climate change? Well, mainstream audiences weren't really looking for the challenge that games like Civilization brought to the table. So the consequences for polluting in games like Civilization 3 were dumbed down drastically. This went as far as the later Civilization games not having any climate related mechanics at all. Most of the huge game developers and publishers were more interested in making a game that was appealing to the mainstream audience than to risk making a game too difficult and not having it sell well. That doesn't mean however that not a single game was depicting climate change, though most of them not pointing it out in an in-your-face sort of style, but because a lot of video games were now story-driven, that made it possible to point out climate change in a more subtle way. For instance, 2008's Dead Space and 2009's Borderlands. Both games are set in a world where Earth's natural resources are dwindling and the world leaders are trying to find a replacement in space. Of course, when playing these games, it can be glossed over pretty easily. But when you realize that Dead Space takes place on a mining ship, and the whole reason you're on the planet Pandora in Borderlands is because it is said to be rich of minerals, that's when you start to see the bigger picture. In the meantime, SimCity kept using pollution as a gameplay mechanic in 2007 SimCity Societies. At that point, this game actually had the most expanded way of depicting environmental issues. Not only were clean energy sources, ground and air pollution, visual indications of pollution and even waste management present in this game, land value and inhabitants' health and happiness would go down drastically when the player would pollute too much. However, when talking about good environmental awareness games, SimCity Societies is pretty much never brought up. And why is that? Well, publisher Electronic Arts decided to make this game in partnership with British oil and gas giant BP. In this game, every single environmental or climate related problem can be fixed with wind turbines, solar panels and natural gas factories. All made possible by BP, a company that would cause one of the biggest environmental disasters in history just three years later. Needless to say, big companies were steering away from serious subjects and discussions for the risk of losing money. But, at the same time, a new wave of video games started to emerge. Around the end of the zeros, social media and video platforms like YouTube were starting to become more and more popular. No longer were big review channels the only source of information for video games, because people could just give their opinion on the internet. On YouTube, Let's Play channels grew in popularity and made it so that smaller independent developers, or indie developers, got more reach and promotion without having to work with a huge publisher. Most importantly, these developers had complete creator freedom. First, this resulted in freedom of gameplay, since these indie games didn't have to be molded into what sort of game was popular at that point. Gradually, this also resulted in more freedom around themes and subjects that were raised within the games. Discussions about mental health or terminal diseases were now much more approachable, and of course climate change became a very important subject within video games again as well. Games like Minecraft started out as just a simple idea that would maybe grab some people's attention, but rather quickly grew out to be the most sold game ever, with 200 million copies sold worldwide, proving that video games didn't need AAA budgets or huge publishers in order to become well known. Minecraft developers decided that because of the freedom people had in the game, Minecraft might also be a useful tool of education, which resulted in the Education Edition. This version of Minecraft is specifically meant for teachers and to use in lessons. The Minecraft community started to get interested in using the game for educational purposes and that's how Climate Hope City came to be. A special server filled with real life and fictional ideas on how to tackle environmental and climate related issues. Universities like the Oxford University started to experiment with video games as an educational tool and started to make its own video games, something that will become known as serious gaming. The result was for instance 2011's Fate of the World, 
a game in which the player has to find a way to make mankind progress while tackling some of the world's biggest problems like war, economy and of course climate change. In this game the player would actually learn how difficult it is to manage all these different things at once. Should they focus all their attention on climate change, then maybe some countries would go bankrupt. Should they focus all their attention on finances, then maybe war would break out somewhere. Simply put, finding a balance between all these different things and realizing you can't fix everything is the key to succeeding in this game. Meanwhile, the University of Washington started to experiment with serious gaming as well. Feeling that most games that tackle climate change were not enough fun for the player, they started to develop a series of small mobile games, one of them being Infrared Escape in 2019. In this game, the player is a beam of infrared light trying to escape the atmosphere while dodging carbon dioxide particles. The difficulty in this game is represented by the year you play in. 1850, or pre-industrial revolution, is easier than playing in 2021 difficulty, since there is way more CO2 in the atmosphere right now. Smaller game developers kept coming up with new ways to create environmental awareness. In 2018, Eco was released. Where it first looked like just another Minecraft clone, it quickly turned out to be much more than that. Even though much of the early game is very similar to Minecraft, in that you have to look for resources in order to build a home and survive, later on in the game your actions actually start to have serious consequences on the environment. Using fossil fuels will cause pollution and cutting trees will wipe out forests if you don't replant them. This can result in the destruction of complete environments or habitats. With this sort of huge excel sheet you can monitor everything you do in the game and what effect it has on the environment. Italian developer Mole Industria released Lycania in 2019. This indie title lets the player create a world by placing different blocks which represent things like water, ice, cities, soil, etc. Finding a good balance between the different blocks is the way to complete this game. For instance, cities will only thrive when the environment is livable, otherwise these cities turn into ruins. Creating a livable environment can be done by using water, but using too much water will flood the earth. Even as recently as 2019, an indie game depicting the necessities of bees in the environment got released. The aptly named Bee Simulator is a game in which you become a bee and you're tasked with several important assignments in order to keep your hive healthy. Things like collecting pollen, defeating other bugs and saving your hive from workmen who threaten to cut the tree in which your hive is located. Meanwhile, even bigger companies started to pay attention to the environment. Even going as far as to actually come up with solutions for climate change in the real world. Chinese payment platform Alipay came up with Ant Forest in 2016. Working as a tree planting game in combination with the existing payment app the company already had. When doing environmental friendly things in the real world, like walking to work instead of taking the car, the player can earn points that they can use to plant trees in the game. In order to actually make an impact in the world, a real tree is planted for every virtual tree in the game. This resulted in over 200 million trees being planted as of today. SimCity would also see a new game release in 2013 simply titled SimCity. The game would go on to be hated by pretty much the entire fanbase, mainly because of a required internet connection that made the game virtually unplayable in the first few weeks after release. But environment-wise, the game was actually the most complete of all the SimCity titles. Even though the always online aspect of the game was not liked by the fans, this would mean that your city would be part of a province shared with other people's cities. If you if you decided not to care about the environment and started polluting a lot, huge clouds of smog would cover your town, but would then continue to spread over the whole province, also polluting your neighbor's cities. Simply put, your actions also affect people around you. 2015 would be the year SimCity fans would get exactly what they wanted, but not in the form of a new SimCity game. City Skylines released and was quickly seen as the definitive city builder. It did pretty much everything SimCity did in a similar or even better way. The base game would already give the player the opportunity to make an environmental friendly city, but with the addition of the Green Cities expansion, this would get even easier. Adding 350 assets in the form of biological supermarkets, recycling centers and self-sufficient homes to name a few, Green Cities let players create the most environmental friendly city ever to be possible in video games. 
2016 indicated the release of the sixth Civilization game, but it would take three more years before the game would address climate change head on again. Just like Green Cities, Gathering Storm released as downloadable content and brought the addition of climate change into Civilization VI. It added, among other things, a carbon dioxide meter, ground tiles could once again be permanently destroyed by pollution, and huge coastal cities would have to be protected by flood walls if climate change would result in melting ice caps. It would take life simulator The Sims 20 years before they tackled climate change head on. With a few references here and there throughout the years, it was kind of baffling that a game in which you have to build and support your own household didn't tackle climate change earlier when the Eco Life lifestyle expansion came out for The Sims 4 in 2020. The expansion adds several new items in the game which make it possible to start recycling, create a self-sufficient house, let you make biological products like drinks and candles for whatever reason, and even let you go out on the streets to convince other sims to change to a green lifestyle as well. It wasn't all that weird to see all these huge publishers go back to environment related subjects in their games. The Paris Climate Agreement in 2015 sparked a huge rise in interest around climate change. Meanwhile the United States backing out of this agreement and then going back in there in 2021 actually sparked a lot of outrage around the subject. Mainly because the devastating effects of climate change were starting to get noticed worldwide more and more. Other huge titles of the past few years like 2017's Horizon Zero Dawn would show that the things humans do in the name of progression could actually be the thing that seals our fate. In the game, mankind is forced to live in prehistoric style tribes because human-made mechanical inventions caused the world to end. Throughout the game you can still see the remnants of what is now called the Old World. In a similar fashion to what happened after the nuclear disaster in Chernobyl in 1986, nature reclaimed these huge cities. A pretty significant reminder that nature will definitely move on and even thrive when humans disappear. On the other hand, you have a game like Frostpunk, which shows how nature itself can be the cause of climate change. Set in 1886 after the eruption of Krakatoa, a real-life event that actually happened in 8083 that caused an actual global cooling, the sun is blocked out by the huge amounts of volcanic dust that have been spewed into the atmosphere causing a volcanic winter. In Frostpunk, the player is tasked with creating a new home for the few remaining humans and adapting to the harsh new weather conditions. Frostpunk is a good example that even if humans decide to start living greener and polluting less, nature itself can still create situations in which we're all doomed anyway. In conclusion, throughout the years there have been a lot of games that tackle climate change or environmental problems in one way or another. Whether it's about using the climate as an actual gameplay feature, setting a story in a world destroyed by climate change or even symbolically hinting to human interference in the environment and nature, you can easily see that games are no longer just a source of entertainment. On one hand, it can be hinting towards a better future. It can help you understand these sorts of subjects better and it can help in coming up with solutions to these problems. On the other hand, it can warn people of what is to come if we keep going like this. It can visualize what will become of the world and it can show the consequences of our actions. While at its core always staying a form of entertainment, video games transformed into a multimedia tool to tell a story and educate people. Even in the near future you can see these trends going strong with games like Endling, in which you play as a fox who's forced to find a new home after human interference destroyed its former home or even Beyond Blue, an exploration game which is made with the sole intent of creating awareness around sea life. So to end this video, yes, video games can help you learn more about the environment and climate change. Can it also help you to learn more about things like mental health, history or even social inequality? Well, that's something I'll be trying to answer in my next videos. Thank you for watching.